Hello Blazers, welcome to episode 65 of UAB Green and Told, original release date Monday, February 14th, 2022. This podcast gives us the opportunity to share stories from members of the UAB community. Looking to listen to previous episodes of the podcast? Check out alumni.uab.edu slash green and told or find us on Spotify or the Apple Podcast app. And while you're there, leave a written review to help more alumni discover our podcast. I'm Greg Berry, a UAB alum and assistant director in the UAB Office of Alumni Affairs. It's amazing how things can change. That's the case with today's guest. While he's always had an interest in the outdoors, Dr. Jim McClintock could just as easily have been an English professor and not the endowed university professor of polar and marine biology he is today at UAB. And I wrote this big, long piece on Everest, climbing Mount Everest and the history of Mount Everest and the, the history of the Sherpas that lived there, that culture of the Sherpa. But as Dr. McClintock will share, his career took a different path and he traded the majestic beauty of Mount Everest for the absolute awe of Antarctica. I mean, it, it was just absolutely otherworldly. The scale of the landscape in Antarctica and the continent is just beyond description. Today, Dr. McClintock has an intense passion for his research of the Antarctic, one that he invites alumni to share with him in December 2022. It is a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and it will change you. Antarctica will change you forever, I guarantee it, in a very good way. Cold, white, and desolate. Those three words are probably often used in describing Antarctica. Heck, just the mere mention of the continent can send a chill through your body. It's also the last place you'd think a California kid who grew up in the idyllic setting of Santa Barbara would end up. With his childhood nestled between the beautiful coastal mountains and shimmering beaches of Southern California, Jim McClintock fell in love with nature, something that has stuck with him even today. By the time I was probably 10, my, my dad would drop me off at the University Point with my big surfboard and, and we'd spend the day there on the weekends with my buddies. And, and so that went on uh, throughout high school, junior high and high school was, was the surfing world. Um, when I went off to college at UC Santa Cruz up the coast, um, I surfed a little bit, but I was pretty busy with my college studies. So some of that dropped off. Were you any good? I was, I would say I was middle of the pack. I, I was never, you know, one of those guys that, you know, everybody sort of howled and clapped after you, you know, came off a wave or something like that. But I could take off on waves and, and have a good ride. Um, I get a little squeamish when the waves got, you know, overhead in their size. You know, once they got up to about eight to 10 feet, it was, uh, I could feel the adrenaline running. As a teenager, when you're out on the, on the ocean, on the waves, surfing and, and just enjoying nature, at what point... Did it come to you that you wanted to do something like marine biology or did it come at that point or did you need the college experience first? I, I fell in love with uh, English, actually, when I was in high school. I had a, you know, how you have those teachers that just somehow connect. And I had an, an English teacher who recognized that I had some writing talents and sort of set me free to write topics that were interesting to me and and at the time i was very fascinated with the with the mountains and backpacking and, and coastal things and i wrote this big long piece on everest climbing mount everest and the history of mount everest and the, the history of the sherpas that lived there that culture of the sherpa so i i actually started college declaring english as a major and uh but then it all sort of went out the window when I took an introductory biology course and one of the faculty teaching the course was a marine biologist and, and I just fell immediately in love with marine biology and I realized that all those, uh, all those days spent on the coast and tide pools and on surfboards was, was meant to be in terms of my academic interests and in seeding that. So it's funny because I've sort of circled back to my interests in English now that I'm writing popular books in science. But yeah, marine biology hit me over the head like a sledgehammer as a freshman in college. And, and then I just knew that's what I wanted to do. So what was it about marine biology that just captured your attention? Well, I had grown up uh, with a father who was a professor in experimental psychology. Uh, I understood the scientific process and, and I loved the idea of discovery, new things. Uh, I realized the oceans were unknown largely and their marine life was an exciting place to go 
And I believe it was in my sophomore or junior year in college that a professor, uh, actually the same one that got me interested in marine biology, sent me off to a marine research laboratory on the coast north of San Francisco called Bodega Bay Marine Lab. And there were 20 students from all the different UC campuses across the state that we lived and worked and breathed marine biology for an entire semester. And when I graduated from that course, uh, I can remember standing in front of the marine lab for a class picture. If I go back to that picture now, half of those students are professors of marine biology across the country. No kidding. And, and what that says is that this was an incredibly formative experience and something that I tell my students all the time at UAB is if you get a chance to get out and really immerse yourself in a field by, by going to a place and, and doing something there, such as a marine station for me in this case, do it by all means, uh, you know, take that study abroad course or go down to Dauphin Island Sea Lab, do something that really gives you a chance to feel it out. Because, boy, when I came through that course, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I love the science piece. Um, and this is despite being told that jobs in marine biology were a challenge. You know, it wasn't like going to med school or law school where, you know, you knew you had a position once you got out the other end. And I was willing to take that risk um, and, and say, this is what I want to do, and I'm going to make it happen one way or another. And it worked out great. When you started that track as a marine biologist, what was kind of the end goal? Was it teaching or was it a different avenue? I think I was always captivated with the idea of combining teaching with research. So that's why a UAB was such an attractive position for me. I had offers from several other universities that were more teaching oriented and uh I love to teach, don't get me wrong, and UAB has been a wonderful place with wonderful students and, and I wouldn't give it up for anything, but to have that balance of having a research laboratory provided for you, uh, the opportunity to write grants, get funding from the National Science Foundation, uh, it opened up doors for me to work in Antarctica, uh, having this solid research support here at UAB behind me. Uh, so it just worked out to be a very nice balance. I never really, you know, I never really thought, well, I want to go off and just teach college. Um, it was always, I want to combine it with research. I want to see the world. I want to get out there and do marine biology in, in different places and learn different things. Um, and I want to take students with me through that research route as well. And that's where graduate students have come in so nicely. Do you remember that first research that you did in marine biology and what was it? It was when I was a student at the marine lab at Bodega Bay, north of San Francisco. And we each student had to do an original research project. Mine happened to be looking at sea urchins that live in tide pools and trying to understand how rapidly they were growing as a function of where they were in the tide areas. So were they, if they're high up in the intertidal where stressors are higher, versus tide pools down low where they're covered with water more, there's more food. <clears throat> so it was comparing the growth rates of populations of sea urchins in the rocky intertidal. And that was my first uh, uh, undergraduate research project. And that led on to going to a graduate school to work uh, on echinoderms, which includes the sea urchins and the starfish in this group. So, so it was very instrumental in my career. At what point in the career did your studies start to kind of focus on or expand to Antarctica? Well, this all happened one day when I was working with John Lawrence, my mentor at the University of South Florida. I had begun the graduate program there, and I think I was early on, maybe a year or two in, uh, and John walked into the lab one day and asked if I would step out in the hall. He wanted to chat with me. And uh, he took me out there. I thought I was in trouble. But he said, you know, James, he's very formal, James, um, I have an NSF grant and I can take one graduate student to Antarctica with me and I would like you to consider being that student. And I was just stunned, you know, and I said, well, of course, I'll go to Antarctica with you. And that's what started it all off. Uh, we took off for a three month stint at a French Antarctic station wow. in the southern Indian Ocean called Kerguelen came back with lots of data, published a number of papers, uh, and it literally paved the way for my academic career in Antarctic marine biology. What was that first impression of seeing Antarctica and stepping foot on that continent? Oh, it's amazing. Um, 
Now, the first place I went was the subantarctic islands. So this, it wasn't covered with snow and ice. It was covered with, there was vegetation, snow covered peaks in the distance, but penguins, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of penguins and, and, and elephant seal, you know, everywhere. I mean, we literally had to dodge the elephant seals to get to the cafeteria from our dormitory. It was stunning. I mean, I was brought to tears when we visited a king penguin rookery on this trip. And there were literally about a million king penguins running up, you know, just nesting in this valley. And as far as you could see up the valley, little black and white dots. Uh, and up on the hillsides, there were giant wandering albatross nesting. These birds that have, you know, this 10 foot wingspan that will spend thousands of miles at sea sailing, soaring. I mean, it, it was just absolutely otherworldly. The scale of the landscape in Antarctica and the continent is just beyond description. I mean, you, you, you looks like you can reach out and touch a mountain range and it'll be a hundred miles distant. Um, just phenomenal. And then the fact that the wildlife uh, has no fear of humans. So, you know, we'd be out at the ice edge at McMurdo Station, you know, collecting, diving or whatever you, and we'd see a little line of black and white dots in the distance. And we'd realize that it was a, a line of emperor penguins, the world's largest penguin. And I'll never forget one day when the, when the line redirected itself and headed across the sea ice to come over and visit us. And the, the penguins came up to us and they formed a circle in front of us and just sort of, they're all talking to each other like crazy. And we're standing there with our cameras taking thousands of penguin. I don't know what people do with thousands of penguin pictures, <laughs> but you know, and then you just kind of felt like one of the penguins said something. And they all lined up in single file and took off again, you know, and disappeared over the horizon. And it, it was like, it was surreal. Uh, so those kinds of things can happen in Antarctica. And, and that's what makes it such a special place. So from that first trip to now, you, you've been well over a dozen times now to Antarctica. 31. 31 times to Antarctica. Is it a new experience every time? Yes, absolutely. This is what's so phenomenal about it. I know my mother used to say, Jim, why are you going back to Antarctica again? You've been there, you know, you've done that. I said, no, it's not like that. Every time I go, it's unique. And this is what makes Antarctica so special as well. Um, in fact, I remember just being down there this last December, talking to somebody as we were gazing out over the landscapes from the, from the deck of the ship we were on. Um, and he turned to me and said, you know, the sky, the lighting, the clouds, everything, it changes every 15 minutes. I can't believe it. And it, it is a changing environment that you just get the sense that it's refreshing itself all the time. Um, I never see exactly the same wildlife. There'll be different things that we see on each trip. We'll have different encounters with whales. Uh, we will go to a different research station or, or visit uh, someplace we haven't been before. Uh, so it is different every time. And of course, what I really enjoy is watching people who've never been to Antarctica experiencing it. And, and then I'm sort of, sort of enjoying that, that look in their eyes. The first time the Zodiac brings them to shore and they get off and there's 10,000 Adelie penguins in front of them. You know, what is your expression when you've been told that those penguins have to be kept at bay, you have to keep 15 feet from them by, you know, the law of the international treaty. But then you realize that the Adelie penguins can't read and they come right up, you know, and they stand below your feet and they look up at you and, you know, everybody is just going, this is amazing. So I, you know, I love to watch Antarctica happen in the eyes of others. And, and that is a real treat. You take trips routinely with guests, alumni who can take part in this endeavor. Talk about the trip coming up in late 2022. What does it involve? What can they expect? Because this is, unlike you, it's a once in a lifetime experience. You've been there many times. Yes, yes. No, it truly is. It is a once in a lifetime trip and it will change you. Antarctica will change you forever. I guarantee it in a very good way. You'll return an ambassador to Antarctica. 
The trip itself is uh, Abercrombie and Kent Travel came to me 17 years ago and asked me if I would lead one trip a year to Antarctica for them, knowing I was a busy UAB professor and I couldn't disappear for trip after trip. And I took that on. I took on the uh, the opportunity a little bit uh, cautiously at first, not knowing much about tourism in Antarctica, but I quickly became a convert. Um, it's a wonderfully run operation, very environmentally sensitive. Uh, it provides safe opportunities for people to get to shore. The cruise includes visits to shore twice a day. Uh, we leave from Ushuaia, Argentina. We sail across the Drake Passage and we spend a week doing morning and afternoon landings. And we keep the number of people on the ship under 200 because you, you're only allowed to have 100 people on shore at a given time in Antarctica by law. And so we want to make sure everybody gets to shore twice a day. So with a small group like that on the cruise ship, we can do that. Um, in addition to myself lecturing on the cruise on climate change and my work in, in drug discovery and marine invertebrate chemical ecology and diving in Antarctica, there's about 10 other lecturers that are absolutely superb. The educational piece aboard the ship is fantastic. Fantastic. And then just the adventure every day of going to shore and you have an option to hike up to the top of a, of a hillside to look back down in the bay or you could stay on the shore and take pictures of the elephant seals or, or maybe the uh, you might be visiting one of three different species of penguin rookeries, the chin strap, the gen two, the adeli, uh, just fantastic wildlife. So it is a fantastic experience. People rave about the cruise. And it's always fun because somebody will come on the cruise and tell me the reason they're coming is they got to touch the seventh continent. They've been to all but Antarctica. And so they saved this for last because, you know, they, their friends told them it's terribly cold down there. You're going to be miserable, which is completely untrue. The Antarctic Peninsula where we go is relatively warm. Uh, we have temperatures in the 30s, 40s, even the 50s wow. uh, while we're there. It's the banana belt of Antarctica. You're taking off layers as you hike because you're warming up. And so it's, it's wonderful because I like to take that challenge. Why are you here for the seventh continent? And then when we're coming back across the Drake, I say to them, well, what do you think? And they say, this is by far the most amazing continent that I'll ever visit in my life. Uh, and that to me is very satisfying. So... Um, if you're interested in the cruise, learning more about it, um, you're welcome to contact me directly. And I have a, a travel agent here in Birmingham that I work with who will take care of all the details for you, uh, provide all the, you know, the nitty gritty travel information. And it's from December 9th to December 23rd. So you're back on the 23rd time for holidays and stuff like that. And we do some special things on board. If you come in, in my group, um, we always have a special meeting with the captain of the ship, a little uh, question and answer session and up in his cabin or in, in a nearby location. And, you know, we'll do a few extra things. If we get to see Palmer Station where I work, the ice conditions are good and, and we can get in because of COVID situation or whatever, uh, which we hope to do this coming December again. Um, I'll introduce you to my family at Palmer Station, where I live and work the last 20 years. Um, and you'll get a chance to meet the scientists and to meet the people, the doctor there and the guy that's, you know, the most important person, the chef. And, you know, it's just people love that experience of being immersed in, in the science of what's happening there and how their tax dollars are supporting this fantastic station. So that's an add on bonus of going with me is because they allow us to visit in part because I'm on the ship and I have an active research program there. I'll be sure to include your contact for information as well as a link to the trip in the show notes. Talk a little bit about the research that you've done. What do you go to Antarctica and look at? What are you trying to discover? Well, there's two main areas of research that I've been involved in, in the last, say, 20 years. One of them is the field of chemical ecology. Uh, just to boil that down very simply, uh, if you are a marine organism like a sponge or a coral or something and you can't get up and run away from a predator and you don't have a shell, you are likely to produce toxic chemicals that are sequestered in your tissues to protect yourself from predators or things that want to grow over you. So we look at how those chemicals um, play a role in the ecology of these marine systems in Antarctica, both the seaweed communities and the invertebrate communities. And then secondarily, we've had a long-term program to see if the chemicals that we discover 
that are that are active biologically also have the potential to fight cancer and AIDS and cystic fibrosis and different bacterial infections. And we've actually had some interesting discoveries there that are promising in this regard. And that's one of the lectures that I'll give aboard the ship is to talk about that. The other area of research that NSF has funded us to do in the last uh, I'd say decade, is to look at the impacts of climate change on the marine invertebrates and the seaweeds. Because the Antarctic Peninsula where you would be visiting on the cruise is dramatically warming. And this is very interesting to see it firsthand. And what we do is we study the impacts of warming and also a phenomena called ocean acidification where carbon dioxide that we're releasing into the atmosphere is absorbed into the ocean or all the oceans and it's causing the water to become a little more acidic than it used to be and animals are being challenged by this growing acidity so we study that in antarctica because antarctica is sort of the canary in the coal mine because the colder the water the more co2 is absorbed and this is a very cold ocean the southern ocean is very cold so it is a great place to study ocean acidification and kind of get a sense of you know who are going to be the winners who are going to be the losers in a future world where the oceans become more acidic. So those are the two primary areas, chemical ecology and climate impacts uh, that we're doing research on. And I have to admit, it's not just me, it's a collaboration uh, with Dr. Chuck Amsler here at UAB and Maggie Amsler, his wife, who's my research associate, and a colleague in Florida, Bill Baker, who's a chemist. So we, it's very much of a, a collaborative research enterprise, which, which I think is, is fantastic. In January 2021, we hosted a webinar with you from penguins to plankton, the changing environment of Antarctica. How have you seen Antarctica change in the 20 plus years that you've been going? Very tangibly. I mean, for example, the glacier behind our station, the Mar Glacier. When I went there 20 years ago, uh, you know, about once, twice a week, you, you hear a huge crack. And, and, you know, you'd look out the window of the station, there'd be big waves coming down the bay because the Mar Glacier had just calved, uh, dropped a big chunk of ice in the bay. This is happening, you know, now four or five, six times a day. Uh, you sit in the office at Palmer Station now, you hear the crack and you don't stop typing you don't get up and run down to look out in the bay. This is just part of the day. So this is reflective of what's happening all up and down the 800 mile peninsula is these glaciers are receding. They're breaking up, they're releasing ice into the sea. And if they're releasing ice into the sea from land, as many of these glaciers are sitting on the land, then they're contributing to global sea level rise. And that's something that scientists are taking into uh, consideration as they look at the coasts of our country, how Antarctica is going to impact the amount of sea level rise in, in Miami or, or here in Alabama. So Antarctica is connected to all of us uh, in this sense. So these are, and, and then from a wildlife standpoint, the most poignant example of Antarctic climate change impacts is the Adelie penguin, which lives in large numbers around the station and has for a very long time. But over the past 45 years, um, there's been a fantastic study that has tagged thousands of these Adelies and followed them. And we now know that almost 90% of them have disappeared from the local islands, um, largely because of climate change. A um, couple things are happening as it's getting warmer, uh, the air is more humid and moist air can carry more snowfall than in the past. So it seems ironic, but what's happening is the Adelis show up, they lay their eggs very similar time of year, every year, it's kind of a genetic program, you know, and they lay the eggs and then along comes this unseasonably late snowstorm that buries the whole colony in snow. And when the snow melts, sadly, the eggs cannot survive that. So you can lose a generation of Adelis um, at a time. And then the other thing is they Adelis love the sea ice. They, they're dependent upon the sea ice that forms every winter and disappears every summer. It doubles the size of Antarctica every winter. It's that important. It's about five feet deep. The sea ice has, is disappearing around Palmer Station and along the peninsula because it's warming. And so the, the penguins, the Adelis, use that sea ice as a platform to slide across and then get out to the edge and get their food and get back. And they can do that very cheaply by sliding on their bellies. They're really cute. Um, but now they have to swim much further offshore. And so they're using a lot of that important energy to raise their chicks. They're having to use that to get out to their food. So there's several things that are, are 
putting challenges in front of the Adelis. Um, at the same time, uh, the, there's two other species of penguins that are moving into the station, uh, the Gen 2 and the Chinstrap. Now these are warmer weather penguins, but as the weather is warming around our station, they're showing up. They're extending their range down the peninsula. Um, so we're having a, a very significant shift in the whole ecosystem right in front of our eyes over about 20 years. And that's what's so different about this climate change compared to past climate changes is that this is happening. We're, we're giving this a huge boost by putting this greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So it's happening very quickly. And biologists are very concerned because some species can't adapt this quickly to these changes. And that's what's different about this climate change. Is there anything we can do as humans to slow the process, what's happening in Antarctica, or even reverse it? Well, that's a great question, and there are things that, that you can do. Everybody asks me this as I, I travel around the country talking about climate change. Probably your most important uh, weapon or tool to fight climate change is your vote, your political power. Um, people don't realize it, but that letter to a senator, that letter to a congressman, that vote for somebody who is sensitive to the, the fact that we need to address climate change can be very important. Um, and then there's lots of things you can do personally. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed here in Alabama and the South that, that there's some very promising things that you see happening. I, I didn't realize that I'd ever see our governor, uh, Kay Ivey, stand up and proclaim that, that there's going to be electric car charging stations built all up and down our highways with, with state fund money. Mercedes down the road here has 10 models of electric cars coming out uh, next year, over the next few years. So we're seeing progress. There's things that you can do. You can get involved in nonprofit environmental groups that are working towards clean energy. Uh, and you can do things around your house. You know, you can seal your doors. You can look at the, the kinds of things that a homeowner can do. I mean, people laugh at it, but just changing out your light bulbs to the latest technology and light bulbs can have a big savings on your electric bill and, and help the environment. So all of these things are great to do. I tell people that have the means to have stock investments, think about your stock portfolio. You know, you can now, most of the places that handle your mutual funds and things like this have what are called sort of ethically focused bundled investments. And believe it or not, my my guy, my financial guy told me the other day that they're now doing very well on the market. It's not it's not like you're making a donation. You're actually bringing home the bacon from your investments and doing it by investing in clean corporations. So that's something to also keep an eye on. So all of these things are, are possibilities. Can we ever reverse what's happening? It you know, it would be a very long term investment and it depends on what you're talking about. Um, for example, you know, the ocean acidification situation is while that CO2 goes into the ocean very quickly, it comes out very slowly. So it doesn't, it's not always like if you stop things today, it's going to reverse as quickly as you cause the problem. But it will slow down and it will eventually reverse. But that's going to take quite some time. What we have to do is realize as a country and as a world that if we don't slow things down, if we don't go to a green uh, economy, if we continue to put these greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, that the kinds of things that we're experiencing all over the world are going, only going to get worse. You yourself live in a state where we are now experiencing torrential rainfall. Um, the rain doesn't come down like it used to. Uh, and this is related to warming. The warmer the air, the higher the dew point, you're going to have these torrential rains. We're having rivers overflow. These are all things that are big picture. They're in front of us. We see them happening. We have This has to become actionable um, and we have to work to make it change, slow it down and ensure a safe future for our generations to come. How does one go about getting a point in Antarctica named after them? <laughs> well, one good thing is I'll never be pointless. Um, <laughs> yes. So uh, this is something that is a little easier to do in Antarctica than it would be in, in uh, Alabama or in Montana or wherever, because Antarctica is a massive continent the size of India and China, and there's lots of things to be named. But if you have a career that focuses on some aspect of Antarctica, um, it's possible that somebody can uh, write a letter of, of nomination 
and send it to the U.S. Board of Geographic Names. It's, it's an entity in Washington, D.C., a federal agency, and they will take it under consideration. And if deemed appropriate, they will either find or you can suggest an appropriate naming. Now, what happened with me is that this point is on one end of a bay where a lot of our work has been done in Antarctica. So it's very much tied to our research activities. And my colleague, Bill Baker, is named for the opposing point. So Bill and I will face each other for eternity. It's wonderful. I've been up on the point. Um, they won't let me build a condo there, but it's a great place to visit. It's a beautiful view. So that was very, uh, I was extremely honored to have that happen. That's Dr. Jim McClintock, endowed university professor of polar and marine biology at UAB. For Dr. McClintock, trips to Antarctica are routine, but for most of us, it can be a trip of a lifetime. I've included information in the show notes about Dr. McClintock and his upcoming trip this December that you can join. You can also find it at alumni.uab.edu slash Antarctica. Dr. McClintock has been part of the UAB family for more than three decades, which gives him a good idea of what it means to be a blazer. Well, for me, it's representative of what I like to call a, an, an institution where the, the, uh, the mortar has not set between the bricks. I think one of the things that attracted me to UAB as a young assistant professor many years ago was the fact that it was a very collaborative institution. I immediately sensed that there were opportunities to work together within the department, across departments, with the medical school, all these, all these wonderful opportunities, and I have not been proven wrong. Uh, it's been a very supportive, collaborative environment to be in. You know, UAB is just, it's special. Be sure to listen into previous episodes of UAB Green and Told. You can find all of them online at alumni.uab.edu slash greenandtold. Have a story to share? Email me at greenandtold at uab.edu. Finally, be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search UAB Alumni. Thanks for listening, and until next time, go Blazers! <laughs>